Actors, we've all got issues, so let's talk about them. I'm your host, Juaniala, and this is Actors with Issues. Hello, ladies, gents, and non-binary friends. Welcome to another episode of Actors with Issues with me, your host, Juan Ayala, where we talk uh, shop with guests from TV, film, and Broadway. And joining us today, please welcome to the stage actor Diego Mejia and director and writer Sebastián Rea. Diego, Sebastián, thank you so much for being here. Welcome. Yeah, thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you. It was a pleasure to be here and talk to you. Yeah, of course. So you guys are just a few weeks um, after the fact of your East Coast premiere. Um, for your short uh, heritage at the New York Latino Film Festival. So what was the feeling of having it seen on a big screen like that? And I mean, um, now I'm curious because we had just spoken before, but Diego, had you seen it like on a big screen prior to that or or no? Yeah, so um, I was lucky enough that the same thing lined up because um, I'm originally from California and I'm based in New York now, um, but it lined up perfectly where I was in California at the time where it was going to premiere. So I went down to LA um, and got to see it at La Leaf and got to see everyone who worked on it. Uh, it was there Sebastian um, and we got to watch it um, at, at the festival, which was really amazing. So getting to see it again is always just, you know, very exciting. Yeah, it was really incredible because the first uh, premiere we had and in LA it was actually the 26 minute cut of the film. And that was like the first version we made coming out of the program of the Inclusion Fellowship from La Leaf and Netflix. So we screened the 26 minute version and then uh, the program helped me cut it down another 10 minutes because they said it would help get into other festivals and they can program it if it's shorter. So I, I made a 16 minute version and that's the version that I premiered in New York. And it was just really special to see like the full 26 minute version and then also see the shorter version in New York City with like a lot of the crew and cast that we all made it because we shot it in New York. And I also brought like my mom to check it out, some family members who have never seen it before either. So it was like really special and definitely got the effect of what it did being the 26 minute version and the 16 minute version. And and um, definitely taught me a lot of in terms of like editing and like yeah. not being precious about the cut and whatnot. So it definitely was a learning experience, but really beautiful. And I have to ask during that editing process, was there like a scene you had to fight for to stay in the cut or was the everything that they suggested you take out sort of just like, okay, yeah, that makes sense. Well, actually, um, when I first had the 26 minute cut, one of the biggest scenes that I had to fight for was actually the dancing sequences in the film and um you know in the original version we I, I gave like five minutes alone to just the dance sequence of like ecuadorian indigenous dancers and how Rumi diego in the character role you know dances there his family comes to see him and so forth and that scene like helped establish the dancing the culture but also like Rumi's friends and family and like how they can support him um, so they wanted that whole sequence cut and I had to fight. I was like, this is really important. You know, Rumi, we need to know who his parents are, the relationship, like the dance. This is why I'm doing the movies to have the Ecuadorian indigenous dance in it. And um, what was cool about the program is that, you know, they, they don't tell you just cut it. Like, you know, there's not a studio. They're not going to be like, cut it or you're fired. They kind of like help you work and find, help you get to where they want you to be. And because technically they were right, you know, like the, the 26 minute version feels and it serves kind of like as a pilot or a proof of concept but the 16 minute version is just a lot tighter and really feels like a tight short film and i think what the middle ground that we we came to was uh keeping the dance but reimagining the sequence and how it plays out in the film mm -hmm. so i don't want to you know blow it up or anything but in now in the film the the dance is kind of seen as like Rumi's or diego's main um like like his ideal self and the idealized version of like who he wants to be, what he wants to accomplish, and also like what gives him the strength and the support to actually come out and be happy with himself. So yeah, we had to fight a lot for that, but it, it made it in and it, it became stronger, I think. Mm -hmm. And in the grim scheme of things, you did mention sort of as a pilot or proof of concept, is this something you'd want to expand into a series or into a feature? Like what sort of the, the ideal future for the, for the project? Yeah, so the, the the short film version actually came from a feature script that I had written years ago. Since since this was um, based on my own coming out story, which happened when I was 18, I had been wanting to tell this story for like 15 years almost. I just didn't know like the right way or I was also like kind of 
ashamed to tell it in many ways because I knew this would be very vulnerable for me and putting my identity out there was not, I wasn't really comfortable with earlier in my life. But as I grew up and came more into like who I am, I, I wanted to be more unapologetically who I was. And so it, this was a perfect film uh, for me to tell and the story for me to tell. And now that I have a pilot version of it, um, we, I actually made a, a pilot version of the script of heritage and the script actually got picked up by outfest the screenwriting lab uh, yeah. as an episodic series and they helped me um workshop the the, the pilot and um help me like reimagine it into a series and what that would take so currently i'm also uh, working it into a series but i'm um, also submitting the pilot to other programs and workshops and things like mm -hmm. that to to get it out there yeah that's awesome i love how a lot of these festivals and programs like really do try and help emerging filmmakers and whatnot to actually not just like, okay, we'll screen your short film and you might get a prize of some kind and that's kind of it. But it's like they actually try and develop and sort of, you know, help with networking and making connections and all of that. It's always so great to hear because um, sadly, a lot of film festivals are that previous sort of version. I said that they will screen it and then that's it. It's sort of just a screening opportunity, but they don't really help with developing. So the ones that do, that's, you know, just makes it all the more important. Yeah, 100%. And sort of going back, um, when each of you were growing up, were there any role models you saw on screen or maybe even like mentor figures that you saw and were like, that's the career that I want or that's the type of work that I want to do? Uh, Diego, let's start with you. Yeah. Um, so for me, a big one was, um, and I grew up on a lot of like Telemundo, uh, Univision and all those like um, channels, you know, on the weekends we'd have my family playing those, we'd have like a gathering, we'd watch like Sabado Gigante. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I was able to see like, I got a lot of exposure, which I'm really happy that's like a lot of, uh, you know, Latino work. Um, and one of the ones that really stuck out to me because I think he had a conversion from, I guess like Latin American television and film, and then bringing that here to the United States was uh, Eugenio Derbez. Mm -hmm. um, he was a big one. I was a big fan of like uh, his comedy work. Um, my dad really loved his work. And so he obviously um, exposed me a lot to it. And then the big one that was for me was his um, film that he, I think they did a re-release now, um, Instructions Not Included, um, mm -hmm. that I think for the first time I went to the movie theaters and it was a movie that was in like Spanish and they had subtitles in English. And I was for the first time ever, I had seen a theater packed of like Latinos and um, it was the opposite where the, you, you had the like non-Spanish speakers looking and reading the the movie to understand what was going on. And so, yeah, that really stuck to me. And I was like, I want more of that. Um, and yeah, that was probably actually, one of the big ones. Yeah, we actually had just had a honey on the show. Um, oh, really? I had to interview oh, him cool. about his new indie film coming up uh, in a few weeks, um, Radical. Um, based on a true story, it's basically, you know, sort of like a, in the vein of a movie like Lean on Me or Stand and Deliver of this teacher who affects the lives of these young kids and based on a true story. And it's an incredible, incredible movie. I highly recommend. Um, by wow. the time this comes out, that interview will be up on the channel already. So folks who, if you haven't seen it, go see it. Uh, it's a, it's a, one of our bite-sized interviews. It's like, I think nine minutes. It's, it was a short one because he's a, he's a busy guy. Um, but yeah, Sebastian, what about you? What any role models or, or mentors you sort of looked up to? Yeah, um, growing up, my favorite director was um, uh, Alejandro Gonzalez Inaritu. Amores Perros was one of the first movies I saw that like really stuck with me because it was like very indie feeling, it was, like cinema verite, told three stories, but like connected them all. I was just like blown away by that film completely. And um, wanted to have, I wanted to make that movie, you know. And um, another, another role model for me was uh, this Ecuadorian filmmaker called Sebastian Cordero, whose first Ecuadorian film called Ratas, Ratones y Rateros is just so dope and like has all the American stylized sensibilities, but he shot it in Ecuador, in Quito. And it just like represented my home where I'm from. It told like a really cool, fast paced story. And it had a really like fresh sensibilities. And it's because he studied in California, I think uh, one of the colleges over here in LA. 
And um, I always wanted to like go back to Ecuador and like tell a story that's kind of modern and has like modern sensibilities or just like American sensibilities, but um, take place in Ecuador. And I kind of did something like that in 2018. I shot and directed a short film called Ruta Viva, which is based on my true life. Also, it has to do with um, a family that is having dinner and arguing about politics. They are very um, polarized, but they have to work together when a sudden death in the family happens that night. Mm -hmm. And it's really funny because at the time it had to do with like Correa, who was like a very um, nationalist type of president in Ecuador. And they have very, a lot of similarities to Trump. So I kind of like drew on those similarities and the mm -hmm. film won best short at the New York Latino Film Festival into it 2018 was picked up by HBO. So I think for me, it was just like seeing people of color that I wanted to have their careers, like you said, and, and it inspired me to do that. You know, on the show, given the name of our show is called Actors with Issues, we always sort of talk about, you know, career obstacles and things like that that have come up in the past. So I'm curious, you know, in hindsight, is there anything that you know now that you wish you knew back when you first started your career just to like avoid a slump or a hurdle that would have come down the line? And uh, Sebastian, we'll start with you. Knowing what I know now, I probably would have came to LA much earlier in my career. Um, at first, it was tough for me to leave New York, you know, because I was I grew up in New York, and New York was home, and I was like, man, New York over LA, da da da. And, and although I worked in film in New York, like I worked at the Tribeca Film Festival for seven years, like right after college, um, it definitely like opened my eyes to the corporate world of film, but working on set and like getting that break into Hollywood is all in Hollywood in LA. So that's what I'm doing now. So I think if I knew now what I know then, I would have probably came earlier, but at the same time, like maybe I wouldn't have had the same opportunities that I have now if I had not done my time in New York. But I think just like getting out of your comfort zone is, is my takeaway because I was there for so long because I was comfortable, you know? And, and finally when they made the, the trek out to LA, I had kind of like a support system already, but um, if it wasn't for that support system, I probably could have sh came here anyway and started it myself. Especially for actors, um, I think there's something about the importance of also just creating your own work um, that I, I think it took a while for me to also understand that when you're trying to go like get over a hurdle or if you're even like kind of taking a step away and you still want to go into working i guess in in this one way um creating your own work has has really become something that I, I i probably try to stress as much as possible because um you know you're actively out there going and then it, it carries you from the one project that you did and then fills in the gap between the next one and you're still working as an actor as a performer um and getting to tell also the stories that you want you have control over that and i think that's something that we under undervalue and underestimate and i know that you know you can put on all these other hats um while in this process and i think um it, it just opens you up more as, as a performer as well um and i think i i wish i would have i wish i would have known that um from younger because i would have started i think you know writing a lot more and um looking for work that I, I can tell stories about myself or stories that I would want to hear and see as well on, on TV or, or film or whatnot, you know? And, you know, I'm curious with um, each of your sort of um, educational backgrounds and training in the industry, did you, and this is not to sort of speak ill of those institutions that you might have attended, but do you feel that you were prepared to do more than just create your art? Like, were you prepared for the the business side of the industry when you left your schools or conservatories or wherever you went? Mm, I mean, for me, uh, my schooling in film was very much like film production, film theory. I also took political science as like my double major. And well, at the time I did that because um, a lot of friends of mine were undocumented and, and I, I wanted to learn about some way to help them and my first <laughs> feature in school my thesis would have had to do with like undocumented characters and, and so forth but I think no the schools don't teach you like the business side at least for me they didn't teach me the business side of filmmaking or like the corporate side of it they there's no like section that taught me like what distribution meant or acquisitions or development like I didn't know any of that until I got hired 
first as an editor at Tribeca and then like work my way up to content managing. But um, I think all the corporate and, and business side of film that I, that I learned was all from working in, in a corporate place. Um, if anything, the school just taught me like how to produce a short film with, you know, some people. Um, but even that, you know, working on your own indie short film for school is different than working on a, on a, on a real set. You know what I mean? And I think like working on a real set, even if it's just as a PA job or something like that, will that'll teach you everything you need to know, not just like being in school. Even if you didn't study school, like film in school, you could still be a PA and you'll learn a lot more just by doing. Back in my sort of first days in New York, I worked a lot as an extra on different shows and, and, and sets that filmed here in New York. And uh, the second second who was always the sort of one in charge of of the background actors and placing them and all that would say like hey this is the best film school you're gonna get because you're gonna see how all of the cogs in the machine work together to make the product rather than you know like in a film school it's like okay you've got your instructor and then everyone else is on the same level as you in terms of like usually of like knowledge and all of that so it's like instead of all learning together you're seeing the professionals at work and can just absorb and all of that i felt like when i finally booked my first like principal role on the show I like knew all the lingo. I knew what everything meant. I knew what all these like all that stuff was, um, and you know, I just completely agree. You know, even a young filmmaker should definitely you know pick up some some days on a show as a PA and just see how everything works and just go from there. Yeah, and if anything, I wish like schools had those kind of pipelines. You know, like right. all right, you guys are all freshmen, and like all right, now you all are gonna be PAs on these projects. You know what I mean? Like just to to get that hands-on experience is invaluable. And Diego, what about you? Yeah, um, I think I'm actually in a different position right now, um, given because I'm actually still in school. Um, mm. I'm on my last year of my, you know, um, training and all that. Um, I will agree. <laughs> yeah, <I'm, laughs> whew. but um, I will agree that being on set and and going out and getting to do like I also started out probably when I got here, I was really like hungry of like, I want to work, I want to do this. So I also did, you know, background work. Um, and yeah, I think I learned a lot more there than I did in my classes at the beginning. Um, because I, I kind of understood the things that they don't teach you um, in these classes, they'll teach you sure how to perfect and how to make your own method of, of working, but they don't teach you what the work really is like. Um, and so yeah, I think um, uh, once I got out there and was able to do background work, I, I, I picked up also on the language of how they talk on sets, where everything is, who's who, and how that works, um, and kind of your role um, when you come in. Um, I think it takes time, and, and by working, you get to learn a lot more. Um, although, and I think this is maybe just for actors, or I got lucky with the school, um, is that we do get training in like how to how to navigate a bit of your career what it is you want um within your career and how you want to um you know manage it and how to reach out to casting uh, directors how to talk to agents managers um and you know I, it, it is very in traditional sense of having showcases in front to get you in front of representatives and almost get you you know started um, as soon as you're done. Um, and I, I can only say I've been lucky enough um, to have these experiences um, go hand in hand, side to side, you know, and I feel like I've learned so much from that. But I don't think I would have gotten that just from school. I think this will probably be like our 201st episode or something like that. So it's been a lot of conversations we've had, but so I forget who said this specifically, but um, sort of that they've learned a lot more by doing. Um, I think it was the actor Martin Martinez because he started so young and has just kind of booked pretty consistently since then. Um, he never went the college route. He never went to conservatory. He's like, well, I'm repped and I'm booking. So I don't I'd sort of he said it would feel almost like a step back going to school if he was already working. He's like, I have to stop working to go do that. So it's sort of making that decision for what works best for you and your current and your trajectory based on where you currently are. Um, but yeah, I think that's such a, you know, no two pads are alike for sure. So it's always interesting to see how people's pads sort of uh, move around differently. 
Yeah, and just to continue off that, like I think a big thing that, that about us, and I think is that we're very proactive. You know what I mean? Like, um, especially with when I found Diego, he's very proactive in terms of like being an actor and finding the characterization of it and doing the work for it. But I think also a lot of it is like just faking it till you make it. You know, like <laughs> yeah. I feel like for me, like. Um, I was very much working in New York City and uh, never really been on like a big Hollywood set before. And then when an opportunity came to work with JLo on her one of her films, at first I was like, well, you know, I don't know really how, how to be in a Hollywood set. Like, how valuable am I going to be if like, I don't know, like the lingo or I don't know, like this or whatever. But, you know, I did have experience shooting my own films, you know, and being on the corporate side of things and and maybe shooting a commercial here or there. And although I was a little um, timid and, and worried about like failing, I think you just have to go and do it, you know, like fake it and be like, yeah, I know what I'm doing, even though you don't, but like you're slowly picking up everything along the way. Yeah. And I saw this video one time that I now I never forget it because Salma Hayek said it and she sounded so beautiful saying this. She was like, if you make a mistake, that mistake is yours. You know, own that mistake. Don't let anybody take that mistake from you. Say like how that mistake is gonna help you grow and become a better person. And like, you'd only become more valuable because of your mistakes. So I think like that just really rings in my mind all the time now, like whenever there's a new opportunity, like I'm never shy about it. I, I kind of want to throw myself because I want my career to keep enhancing and, and evolving to the next level. So I think like to anyone who's like, scared that they've never been on the set before and they feel like they might be made fun of or whatever like just own your mistakes don't be afraid and the only person is standing in front of your way to the next level is you so you just have to fight yourself and you know with um every project or even you know with with a lot of auditions there's always something to be learned during that process um whether it's you know new material a new sort of technique you're trying or um, when it comes to once you've booked the role, you're making a project. Um, there's always something to be learned in that. There's always sort of things that maybe things go wrong and you learn how to remedy that so it doesn't happen again in the future. But what would each of you say was the biggest lesson learned while working on Heritage? Yeah, um, so for me, um, at, the, at this point, I think I, I had only made one other film that had like, I'm going to say like a budget essentially. <laughs> um, so um, it was still a bit of a learning process for me. Um, I think I had a bit of experience in terms of like, okay, I know how this works, this works, but now, um, now that I had those preliminary things out of the way, how do I like bring myself and kind of like, uh, Sebastian said is, um, you know, um, how do I find this character and how do I like make this the best that I can be? And also kind of being unapologetic about making mistakes along the way and trusting that um you know everyone around around me will support me and helping me find you know and, and do the best that I can for this and um yeah I think this was the first time that I've worked on a project where I felt very like um secure to explore um and I think um that was something very very fascinating and very fun to to get to work on um that I, I, going on afterwards, I think I, I try to apply it to everything that I can. Um, and it's it's coming from that security too that you get built from having just a, a great environment to work at too that thankfully, uh, you know, uh, so Sian was able to nurture in the set. And um, yeah, it's a very unique experience um, that I, I hope and wish for everyone to, to, to experience at one point because it is really fulfilling as, as an actor to, to be able to, you know, just focus on doing your work and, and, and acting, you know, helping tell the story. Um, and yeah, I, I, I hope to get to do that again sometime, you know, and, and put that implement that into my work as much as possible. Yeah, that's always sort of a sense of relief when you're like, oh, this is like a, a legit project. There's a whole team. It's not just the writer slash director slash producer slash props manager slash wardrobe yeah. guy slash he picked up the crafty on the way here you know <laughs> like sort of right. three or four people doing everything and of course so many people start that way and you learn to wear all these many hats but it, it does take a so much pressure off of uh, the actor who you know is there to who wants to give the best performance you know and you can only edit around a specific performance so much so you want to give them the best sort of material to work with and uh, Sebastian, what about you? What was uh, something you learned during the process of? 
production wise i would say i would say I, i'm gonna have all my actors from now on do do it funnier and faster just funnier and faster like even if the take needs to be slow and dramatic like give me a read where it's funny and fast you know and i think just like I just like as I was editing the footage, I was like, I always found myself being like, oh, I wish it was like a little quicker. Or I wish it was like mm. a little funnier or, you know, because like when you're acting on screen or like on camera, it's just the camera picks up little nuances. You know what I mean? Yeah. And like you don't have to do anything big or anything, but you have to just like it'll just pick it up. I don't know if I'm explaining this right, but like, no. yeah. I, I listened to one podcast who was like, I think Spielberg was talking about one of his movies and he would say, he would just tell his actors always like faster and funnier, faster and funnier, faster and funnier. And like, not, not even if it just warranted that in the scene, but it was just like help the actor come out of whatever bullshit he has in his head that he thinks yeah. what should be the character, you know, instead of just like being. And I, I, I feel like that might help. So I'm going to like implement that in the future. And the other thing is when you get money for from a grant to make a film or a production, save at least 10% of that money for your taxes at the end of the year. That's a, that's a tip that I'm going to carry for forever. Yeah. Uh, as we you know wrap up our, our conversation, if um, you could go back and give yourself one piece of advice, what would you say? Uh, I would say for me, I would just tell myself not to be afraid, you know, because I think... Uh, me wanting to tell this story of my coming out heritage for 15 years, you know, I put it off and I, I made other films before I made that film because I wasn't ready. And I think a lot of that was because I was operating in fear of like what others would think of me, what even the industry would think of me as like, I didn't want to be a queer director or like a Latino director. I just wanted to like make films. But I think when you champion your differences and you really like champion things that set you apart, um, really beautiful things come from that. And, you will start to resonate your truth. You know, like when you're really who you are, you polar you're polarizing. Because if you are 100% authentic, not everybody's gonna love you or vibe with you, right? But if you're like kind of quiet and like you know you want to be friends with everybody, uh, there, a little part of that comes off as fake because you're not like being your true self because you kind of want to be on on good terms with everybody. That's like holding you back. And I think that's what I that's what I used to do um but now what i would tell myself is just like don't be afraid for all the people you lose you will gain 10 better ones yeah i guess for me um i would say not to because i'm an overthinker um i would say don't think. stress about the nose i think if, if that makes sense um at, at least for me you know in, in my career i've I've been someone who who always tries to do the best and like get get like I think about it logically okay this is how I'm going to do this and this this and this is how I'm going to get there and um it, it took me a while to understand I think now that you know that 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 isn't exactly how this um this industry works in this career and that if you do this 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 you're going to get that and I think don't be discouraged by that because um it, it gets in the way and, and you should be where you are um, and um, kind of accepting that, taking everything that you, 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 you are and you, you have with you and relying on friends and everyone to, to be able to, you know, propel that and, and um, use that for yourself. Um, I think it, it's easy to get caught up in, in how like, you know, how a lot this industry can be sometimes and um, mm -hmm finding the, the, the really like great moments and I make this, you know, very worth it. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah that, that's kind of what I would say. Awesome. Well, Sebastian, Diego, thank you so, so much for joining us on the show today and for talking with us about the issues. And again, congrats on the success of, of Heritage. I can't wait to see, um, you know, where it goes next and where folks can see it. Is there anywhere available for folks to see it right now yet, Sebastian, or no? Uh, right now, no, we're still waiting on some festivals, but uh, eventually I'm sure it'll find a place online. Awesome. Well, folks, stay tuned. And uh, yeah, gentlemen, thank you so, so much again. Thank you, Juan and Diego. Miss you guys. Miss New York. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. Be sure to subscribe to Actors with Issues on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts, and visit our YouTube channel for full video interviews. Actors with Issues is executive produced and hosted by Juan Ayala. See you next time.